Howdy. Sure, maybe we can't bring cartoons into the real world, but we can certainly bring some of their awesome foods to our world, thanks to some dedicated cooks around the planet. Some are delectable treats, while others leave the taste testers retching. What say we witness these combined terrors and beauties together? How do these foods come together in the real world? Let's check out the 10 cartoon foods brought to real life. I'm ready for action, let's begin. Let's start with an obvious choice at number 10. The Krabby Patty. I'm a SpongeBob fan, so I did want to see what these mysterious burgers were like in real life. According to creators of the show, such as Steven Hilberg and Vincent Walter, the Krabby Patty is, apparently, a vegetarian burger. Supposedly, Plankton's chum is the only meat in the entire city of Bikini Bottom. It's actually amazing! Now, it's their show. They can of course say the burger meat's made of whatever they want. But come on, who are these writers kidding? A city where everyone loves vegetarian burgers and everyone hates meat? Okay, clearly this is fiction. Or Bikini Bottom is full of vegetarians. Anyway, aside from the vegetarian patty, the burger is supposedly made of a seaweed sea bun, lettuce, onions, tomatoes, sea cheese, pickles, mustard, and ketchup. And of course, the secret formula, which we'll discuss shortly. The SpongeBob Wiki claims the burger also contains mayonnaise, tartar sauce, and relish. But when Spongy makes the burger right in front of us in the episode Pickles, he doesn't use these sauces at all. So we'll ignore these claims for now. So how does this burger come together in real life? Well, for a time, there was a real life Krusty Krab, as I discussed in my shorts. But let's focus on the Krabby Patty itself. Binging with Babish tried to make it, and he believed the secret ingredient wasn't anything at all, and was just part of a guerrilla marketing campaign by Krabs. This makes sense. He'd want to make every Krabby Patty as cheap as possible, rather than filling it with secret ingredients. Probably similar to the quote-unquote secret recipe in Coca-Cola, or the Colonel's secret recipe in KFC. These are probably also nothing, but doesn't it make it cooler when you say, these have a secret recipe that's locked away in a vault somewhere? Personally, I still think the secret formula is nothing more than being cooked by a dedicated fast food employee who is actually passionate about their job. A staff member as passionate as SpongeBob is pretty rare. But anyway, secrets aside, how's the burger itself? Well, with Babish's Krabby Patty, he decided to use regular store-bought beef. He then seasoned it with MSG, salt, and pepper. And like SpongeBob would, he topped that with lettuce, cheese, onion, tomato, ketchup, mustard, and pickles. And honestly, it looks really similar to the burger from the Krusty Krab training video. And it does look downright delicious. Babish didn't have much to say beyond the fact that it was a perfectly tasty, normal burger. Feast of Fiction used a similar recipe, but they used crab meat, which is an interesting decision for Mr. Krabs' burger. I mean, I get it, given the name. They prepared the crab meat into patties then cook them in oil till golden brown, and then serve them with the same seven toppings as Spongebob and Babish did. They felt theirs was also delicious. Doesn't sound like the Krusty Krab is too different from a regular burger. And given Krusty Krab is the only burger joint we can see in the ocean, maybe it just is that no one in Bikini Bottom has ever tried another burger. <laughs> and for number nine we have... Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Pizza. When it comes to where in America the pizza comes from, I often hear people say, New York is where it's at. If it's good enough for the Ninja Turtles, it's good enough for everybody. Well, okay, I've only heard game apologists say that, but it sounds legit. Let's ask the man himself. It's totally legit. If you are out and about in New York, don't be surprised if you smell or see lots of pizza. New York has a world famous reputation for large hand tossed thin crust pizzas, often sold in big slices. And who are the ultimate connoisseurs of this New York pizza? Why, the Ninja Turtles, of course. These sewer dwelling crime fighters love their pizza. In fact, it's their main food source. The traditional New York pizza topping is simply tomato sauce and shredded mozzarella cheese. But the Ninja Turtles toppings get way weirder than that. Oh yeah? Like what? Like banana and anchovies, or salami, yogurt, and butter pizza. Oh my, that, that sounds truly revolting. Very. And a guy named Kirk recreated and tasted these pizzas. Every single one from the 1987 cartoon. Jeepers, it's hard to say these pizza toppings without recoiling, yet alone tasting them. Sausage and banana, maybe? But I just wouldn't have the stomach for a octopus, chili pepper, and marshmallow pizza. Ugh. I thought this was going to be the worst one ever, and it's actually 
It's not that horrible. Oh, the humanity. I, I think his taste buds are broken. But throughout it all, Kirk was undeterred. And he went on to make and taste test every single one of the terrible Ninja Turtles pizzas on his channel. And to no surprise, many of the pizzas he tried made him nauseated and he needed to spit the pizza out completely. He's a brave fella for trying them. It's a remarkable dedication to the show. I did actually try pepperoni and marshmallow one time and it wasn't too bad. Left me with a giant stomach ache, but it was fine. But others like peanut butter and clam is a little bit too much for me. That's not a line even I would cross for the Ninja Turtles. Overall, Kirk read the taste of the pizzas like this. Almost all of them taste f***ing <laughs> disgusting. Well, yes, but hats off to you for making them anyway. Now that I'm thinking about it, Pizza Hut also has had a long-standing history with the turtles, and they even made a Ninja Turtle-themed pizza at one point. Oh yeah, I think that pizza was exclusive to my country, Australia. I mean, it wasn't really awesome, it was just a value-range pizza with an ugly green sauce on top but it was a green turtle topping. In other words, it was awesome. Honestly, I wish I could have sent it to you, Nick. I feel like you would have appreciated it a lot more than us Aussies did. Yeah, it's a shame I never got to try it, but I got the next best thing. I actually had somebody send me a poster of that pizza and it's hanging up right now in my game room. I'm not kidding. And for number eight, Bob's Burgers from Bob's Burgers. On the surface, one of Bob's burgers looks pretty run-of-the-mill and average, much like Bob himself. But under the surface, there's actually a much more intricate gourmet feast, also much like Bob himself. Some people even call Bob a gourmet in how much effort he puts into each burger of the day. Oh, you are an artist. A beef artist. A beef artist. But what would one of his fine burgers taste like in reality? Well, almost every one of Bob's made burgers has a strange but interesting twist to it. Such as the Baby You Can Chive My Car Burger, with sour cream, chives, and fried pickle wheels. Or the If Looks Could Kale Burger. It has kale. Or the Foot Feta-ish Burger, which comes with feta cheese. And possibly some strange internet results. Or the Bet It All On Black Burger, made with black garlic, a much more expensive fermented version of regular garlic. We even have an official source for the show's recipes in real life, with the Bob's Burgers Burger Book. A fellow called Barry Lewis tried some of Bob's recipes out. He tried the Cauliflower's Cumin from Inside the House Burger from Season 4, Episode 2, Fortnite, containing cauliflower, cumin, and cilantro. In Bob's recipe, he makes a cauliflower mash for the burger. Cauliflower in the bur- Even to a health nut like me, who eats a lot of cauliflower, that sounds weird, man. On the bun, we have lettuce, a lime-infused meat patty with cheese, tomato, and cauliflower. Ugh. Oh, who am I kidding? I probably love it. What a Barry think? Mmm! That is unbelievably good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Well, it's a yes on that one. Feast of Fiction made the Bet It All on Black burger, and they dressed in perhaps the most adorable Bob's Burgers cosplay I've ever seen. I gotta say, the aesthetics look perfect on this burger. They found them delish, and they were both particularly happy with the homemade burger buns. And of course, Bob's foods are right up Babish's alley. Even kind of sounds like Bob. Welcome back to Binging with Babish. Oh, burger. You're cute. So he jumped right into the Chive My Car burger. He was particularly keen to try frying the pickles. And pretty consistently, the results on these burgers look even more delicious than the show's versions. I found nothing but positive reception about all of Bob's burgers in real life. Now, if only we could give him our business in the cartoon and get him out of debt. Number seven, the Reptile Bar. Ah, oh, I remember the Reptile Bar. You know, the one from Rugrats. Tommy and his friends just couldn't get enough of this chocolate bar. Or the Reptile merchandise in general. They really loved Reptile. As the notorious Satanica Pickles would say, It's a chocolate raptor with nuts and caramels and green stuff. The super the duper -est, the double chocolate scooper -est. And with a review with that terrible grammar, you know it's got to be good. A lot of people wanted to try one, some of my community included. So I went looking, and apparently there was a reptile bar that was released back in 2018. There was even a special Reptile and Ice version that had blue frosting instead of green. And as a 90s kid, I gotta admit, I often wanted to try this one too. Even the little chocolate reptile shape, it's so nostalgic to me. Unfortunately, I couldn't try it myself as it's not available anymore. But we do have a lot of reviews of the bar when they were available. And let me tell you, we have a very mixed bag here. One of the more positive reviews was Crystal, who gave it three stars. She said, very good! It really does turn your tongue green. It has a good taste and flavour. 
Tabitha, on the other hand, gave it a one-star rating and was considerably less kind in her review. Gross! I was very disappointed. It was way too sweet and it didn't turn your mouth green. It also tasted cheap and it took forever to melt in my mouth. Ah, what a shame. It sounds like cheaply produced chocolate. Ugh. What a misty think. I've been wanting one since I saw it in Rugrats, but it was so disappointing. Tasted like dollar store chocolate. The only good thing about it is the nostalgia. And speaking of nostalgia, what did Melon say? It tastes like my childhood. To be honest, I'm not really sure what childhood tastes like, but it sounds like the Reptile Bar is just your average cheap chocolate but it can have the effect of turning your tongue green. Honestly, I think I'll stay ignorant as I'd rather not ruin my childhood imagination on this one. To me, the reptile bar will always taste like that perfect honeycomb Easter bunny. Number six, the Flaming Homer, AKA the Flaming Mo. I talk about duff, but personally I think beer tastes like butt. So why don't we talk about a drink that is literally on fire instead? Probably the most striking ingredient in Homer's strange little cocktail is the cough syrup. At first, Homer thought his mixture ingredients tasted pretty meh, but when Paddy accidentally lit his drink on fire, Homer found the taste became exquisite. Fortunately, I don't have to go far to find how this tasted, because my friends The Real Gems and Lydia from The Simpsons Theory have both already tried this drink in real life at The Simpsons Land in Universal Studios Florida where they sell it. Let's start with Gems, who visited the park back in 2019. What do you think of the flaming mo, uh, Homer, Jim? Hey, Strider! Well, the Universal Studios version of the drink is a little different than the original. It doesn't contain alcohol and isn't lit on fire, probably a safety hazard, but it does let off a ton of smoke thanks to the dry ice. I was surprised that the drink tasted like orange. The original had purple cough syrup, so I was expecting more of a grape flavor. But I am thankful that they didn't go with the cough syrup part. The drink is pretty expensive to get, but hey, at least you get to keep the cup. Huh, a smoking orange drink. Thanks for your thoughts, Gems. And what did you think of the Flaming Homer, Lydia? Well, Strider, what do I think of the Flaming Mo? Well, firstly, even though Homer created the iconic drink, the park still calls it the Flaming Mo. But I can overlook this, seeing as I can't deny that the Flaming Mo branding just works. The signage and the fancy souvenir cups just look awesome and do have that lovely 90s feel. And speaking of the cups, there's a clever little compartment for the dry eyes to bring out that smoky and misty appearance. So, it definitely has the drama, but the colour, that was something I was less impressed by. The drink should have been purple like in the show, but in all honesty, it was more like a plain old orange soda. And yes, it was sweet, it was nice, it was, you know, it was alright, but it should have been purple. Make it grape or blackberry or hell, even make it eggplant, but just make it purple. Huh, don't know why they didn't make it purple. Thanks, Lydia. On Sammy's channel, she showed us a bartender preparing it, and the wafting mist really adds to the fun of it. Seems like they turned it into a nice, non-alcoholic orange soda with a whole heaping of visual flair. Number five. <laughs> Poffins from Pokemon. Ah oh man, these look decadent. I love the colors on these. If you're not aware, you can find Poffins in Pokemon Diamond, Pearl, and their remakes. It's a combination of the word Pokemon and Muffin. But realistically, it's more like a cream-filled bun. You're meant to feed the Poffin to your Pokemon. Oh boy, does it heal your Pokemon? Does it raise their stats? No, it raises their cool, cute, smart, and tough traits in beauty pageants. Wow. In other words, they're completely freaking useless. But at least they still look pretty, and do they taste good? Well, our buddies at Feast of Fish and tried making these Poffins in real life, and they did so quite successfully. They first mixed yeast, sugar, flour, salt and milk, and kneaded it into a dough. Then they added the food colouring and continued to knead it. And once they've risen in the oven for two hours, they could add the filling, such as bean paste and mocha. Sounds alright? And voila! Real life poffins. Starting to wish I didn't film while I was hungry. These look perfect to bite into. I don't know if they'll boost anyone's beauty, but how do they taste? Well, they got an absolute thumbs up from these two, with both of them wowed by how well they turned out. And honestly, I'm tempted to give this recipe a try myself. I cannot get over how much we leveled up these flavors this time, man. Yeah, this tastes delicious. But if you want the easier close equivalent, Cook Fiction pointed out that poffins are basically armpans, a type of Japanese sweet roll with a paste filling inside. And it's a very, uh, curvaceous looking food, isn't it? How do I describe it? 
Mm. Oh, I know. They look like a pair of... Mountains. That's right, honey. They look like a pair of majestic mountains on a warm summer day. No, no, can't you see? They look like jugs. Of lemonade. Cool jugs of lemonade straight out of the fridge. Okay, now you're just being silly. I'm watching the YouTube knife dangle over my neck, honey. Let's say we move on. And number four. Garfield's lasagna. I'm sorry, I know this is a weird choice, but Nin insisted on adding Garfield's lasagna to the list. I have no idea why though. I mean, I love Garfield, but it's just lasagna. No, it's not. It's Garfield's lasagna. How? It's lasagna from a three panel comic strip that's had the same running gag for 45 years. Oh, very well. I'll just have dinner right here. It's special kitty lasagna. All right, fine. What do you have to say about Garfield's lasagna then? Well, Garfield's creator, Jim Davis, admits he loves a good, fresh lasagna. And he explained, Arr, I thought it would be funny to have a cat that likes lasagna. But as it turns out, I hear from people all the time that their cats love lasagna. I bet my cat Shadow would like a lasagna too. He's like a Garfield. Well, he certainly eats like a Garfield. Many people have hungered for a slice of Garfield's lasagna. It's actually one of Feast of Fiction's favourite recipes. They explained in detail how to make Garfield's perfect lasagna. So, a perfectly regular lasagna then? No, it's Garfield's lasagna. Tasty Banger also made it. They apparently believe Garfield's lasagna is a vegetarian lasagna. Oh, come on. Who are they kidding? Have they ever seen lions or tigers? Cats are meat-eating hunters. And in the show, we've seen Garfield really enjoys meat. Well, if we look back to the terrible movie, we see a goat helping. And since goats are herbivores, they theorise that Garfield's lasagna is vegetarian. So based on this, I think the recipe for Garfield's lasagna might be lots of tomatoes, onion and garlic plus the pasta sheets and the bechamel sauce. Okay, maybe Garfield's lasagna isn't that different to regular lasagna. Ah oh, well, thanks anyway, hon. At least we know the recipe for a regular lasagna now. Here, I'll show you how good it is. Oh. Number three. Scooby Snacks. It's been pretty apparent to us over the last 40 years that Scooby-Doo likes his snacks. Apparently, even Shaggy likes a Scooby snack. So well loved is his snack that it even convinces Scooby-Doo to do things that he's just too scared to do. Like being the bait to catch a scary ghost or fighting a monster he doesn't want to see. The original Scooby Snacks box doesn't tell us much because it's the prime of lazy Hanna-Barbera animation. It's nothing but a blank blue box with the words Scooby Snacks scribbled over the top. Hopefully it tastes better than it looks. I mean, the big hairy mongrel likes it, and Scooby <laughs> likes it too. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the Scooby Snack actually wasn't that hard to find in real life. And according to a community member on Twitter, Billy the Toilet, It comes in both a dog treat and a human treat. Yay! Fortunately, I can't speak for the doggy treat, but as for the human version, the Scooby Snacks aren't just a snack, but a variety of snacks. These range from vanilla wafers to baked graham crackers shaped as bones. They even come in cinnamon and chocolate flavors. Neat. But in one of the Scooby-Doo movies, Shaggy actually reveals the show's recipe for Scooby Snacks, which is eggs, water, flour, cocoa, sugar, and last and definitely least, dog kibble. Honestly, it sounds bland and horrible, but how do the taste testers rate it? Some versions of the recipe include margarine, vanilla, baking powder, and coconut, which admittedly does sound a lot more palatable. Nerd Foods tried the treats, and this was their thoughts on the taste. They taste like many other graham crackers on the market. Mildly oaty with honey. They aren't the most exciting taste, but they are a great snack for anyone to try. Well, they're not exactly selling me on it. Not sure I'd run into a spooky house for one. Just sounds mediocre. Oh well, what do we got next? Number two, poplars from Futurama. These little fried shrimp delights were found on a remote planet after Planet Express was robbed of their food. Too bad they ended up being the babies of the Omicron race. 
You monsters have been eating our babies! Binging with Babish described Poplars as sentient popcorn shrimp, and I think it's a fair way to describe them. Luckily, I think we're many years away from me making sentient popcorn shrimp. Sure, we discovered they're self-aware Omicronian infants, but a lot of people are still as curious as I am on how they taste. When I asked my community, Adam said, Yes, I know what they really end up being, but that didn't make them look any less delicious in my opinion. Poplar's got me curious. What's the closest we can make in real life? Now, I'm not silly. Uh, okay, I am. But I know we're not likely to eat the first alien life forms we find in the universe. Maybe the second or third one? But if there was a poplar, what would it taste like in real life? Well, luckily, the starving chef created her own version of the poplar. She even posted the recipe in her video. Basically, to make a poplar, she started with a base of shrimp. Which makes sense, for I said they look like fried shrimp. It looks like a ditch full of fried shrimp! What are you, blind?! It looks more like a hole full of fried prawns! Sure, a shrimp isn't exactly an Omicronian, but hopefully it'll still taste good. Starving Chef put the shrimp in a bag with flour, a mix of herbs and spices, and shook it all up to coat the shrimp. Then she coat them in egg wash and dunked it into a crushed cornflakes for that mysterious crunch. Then you simply fry the shrimp. And there you have it, your very own poplar, or the closest equivalent. Unfortunately, she didn't really taste test them, but it's crunchy fried shrimp. How bad could it be? The Planet Express crew seemed to like them. I bet they taste like a fishy version of popcorn chicken. Well, yeah, that's pretty much what I've always pictured with poplars. Fish-based popcorn chicken. So, popcorn fishing? In fact, back in the day, McDonald's kind of had their own version of poplars as well. You might not remember, but McDonald's used to have these things called the Fish McBites. They were basically the filled of fish meat dipped in golden batter. Then they were deep fried and served with tartar sauce. Ugh, I'm sure it tastes better than it sounds. The McBites are okay, they're not amazing. And before we get to number one, let's go through some quick honorable mentions. Sonic's Chili Dog. This dog is just as the name suggests. A jumbo Frank served in a hot dog bun and covered in a chili meat sauce. And as you probably know, it's Sonic's favorite food. Sonic was even kind enough to share his now not so secret recipe in one of his comics. So, the chili dog ingredients are ground beef, onion, bell pepper, mushroom, crushed tomatoes, barbecue sauce, chili powder, cumin, oregano, kidney beans, and of course, a hot dog bun and the hot dog Frank itself. So if you do want to try Sonic's favorite food, you can always try cooking it up yourself. Bachelor Chow from Futurama. In the year 3000, Bachelor Chow is like a staple food for fry. It basically looks like a not-so-appetizing, possibly meat-based cereal. Except, Fry seems to add water instead of milk. What's actually in it, though? Well, the Futurama wiki says it's cheap food, similar in design to dog food. Fry eats it in a dog bowl, but I suspect that's simply him being lazy and not caring. It all sounds revolting, but apparently some people have tried making it, such as binging with Babish. Andy was very brave, and at first he tried using literal dog food as the base for his bachelor chair. Unfortunately, he gagged on the first spoonful due to rancid cheese flavor, so he instead prepared beef bourguignon, a kind of dog food that's edible by humans. Basically, a very well-made meat kibble. He once again put this very gourmet kibble in a dog food bowl and then poured hot water on it. And it did take on a very similar appearance to bachelor chow. He said it tasted okay, but he didn't seem too blown away by it. Which is no surprise, as bachelor chow. Anyway, with those said, on to number one. And for number one, the triple gooseberry sunrise from the Spongebob movie. I guess I could use one of those. Now you're talking! Also known as the Goofy Goober Sunday. Let's finish on a fun note, because if you ask me, this ice cream sundae looks absolutely delicious. And it's pretty clear that Spongebob and Patrick like them. I counted their leftover dishes, and they snarfed down like 29 of these? I swear I felt lactose intolerant just watching these two cram these down. But we can at least confirm from this that they clearly enjoy them. So what are these goofy sundaes made of? Well, according to the Spongebob wiki, it's three scoops of vanilla ice cream, with chocolate sauce hair, three banana and cherry limbs, three candy buttons for a face, and a big red licorice smile. The wiki claims that it gives intoxication symptoms to consumers, but honestly, if I ate 29 of these things, I think I'd look that garbage as well. Feast of Fiction describes Spongebob and Patrick's intoxication as a ice cream hangover. Ready to have an ice cream hangover. And yeah, that seems the best way to describe it. They tried making the sundae, and honestly, it looks near identical to the original. How did it taste though? Basically like a vanilla and chocolate banana split. Because that's essentially what this sundae is, just a different shape. 
But what's a banana split taste like? Yeah. What? I thought everyone knew that. No. When's the last time you ate a banana split? Uh, yeah, fair point. I looked on taste.com and this is what they thought of their banana split ice cream recipe. Lin Lin said, I used walnuts instead. Yum! This was Jolene's thoughts. An absolute classic, easiest dessert I've ever made and I couldn't get enough of the chocolate sauce. It was absolutely divine. Yum-o! Well you two, does that paint a better picture? Yeah! And with those said, let me know if there's a particular cartoon food you'd like to see brought to our real world. Or feel free to just say hi, that's always nice. Anyway, thank you for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time. Today's member question is from Amanda Halberg. They ask, when you run marathons, do you listen to anything and what? If not, what keeps you going? I mostly run trail races nowadays out in the mountains and out in the quiet, sometimes I'll just listen to the birds and the wind and sometimes just wanna be alone with my thoughts. But sometimes I'll put on a little background music from one of my old favorite video games like Sonic 2, Sonic Adventure 2, Sonic Generations, Metal Gear Solid 5, No More Heroes 2, Pokemon games, and even a few old anime. Thanks for the question.